Hi listeners, and welcome back to The Inside View, a podcast about AI progress. To think more clearly about the future of AI, the first step is to be more calibrated in your predictions. That's why in this episode, I interview Peter Wildeford on forecasting. Peter is the co-CEO of Rethink Priorities, a fast-growing nonprofit thinking about how to improve the long-term future. On his free time, Peter makes money in prediction markets, and is quickly becoming a top forecaster on Metaculus. I had a lot of fun talking to Peter about the probability of London getting new, and I hope you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. Without further ado, here's my chat with Peter. The Inside View. The Inside View. The Inside View. Um, maybe we could start with a definition of forecasting for our listeners that are not very familiar. Yeah, I mean, I think it's easy to talk about, just hard to do, but basically you're just trying to tell the future, um, decide what events will happen in the future, given what you know now. Um, and obviously, since no one can perfectly see the future, you want to think probabilistically, like what is likely to happen or unlikely to happen. And um, ideally, you would give like a probability assessment in like a, a fraction, like 80% or 30%. And based on that, you can express ideas about the future at different levels of confidence. Um, and from there you can like, there's like a whole system of reasoning and betting and optimal um, decision-making that can happen based on forecasting. Um, so it's pretty cool. You can do risk management, um, all sorts of different things. Yeah, it's a great way to take decisions and improve decision-making by creating a good map of what could happen. and. I think it's especially important um, since COVID was kind of not um, was kind of unexpected, and that's when kind of forecasting took off, right? Yeah, I think that forecasting definitely started interesting me a lot in the um, run up to COVID. I definitely wish that I had been as active forecasting then as I was now, that as I am now, because I think that was a really great learning opportunity. Um, yeah, I think anytime our society is faced with a very unexpected event, it definitely renews a lot of interest in seeing how we can detect these sorts of events in the future. People were also surprised with Putin getting really angry and starting to um, launch nuclear threats. And I think at that time, people were yeah, really surprised and tried to um, do a bunch of forecasts on where it could go. And he started like pushing limits of what people were expecting. Did you get the impression as well? Yeah, I think it's there's definitely a lot of uncertainty and instability with regard to Putin's actions, but I think a lot of them have been foreseeable. Um, I mean, there certainly have been forecasters, um, including myself, that um, definitely thought that there was a very high risk of invasion from Putin as early as December of last year. I think at that point I had put like a 55 to 60% chance that Putin would launch an invasion just based on like some of the things that Russia was saying and their like mass force build up and also just like the general history of Ukraine and Russia. Um, I think since the war unfolded, I was definitely very surprised, happily surprised at how well Ukraine um, defended against Russia. And um, yeah, I'm definitely curious and a bit worried about how, um, how that will continue to play out as um, Russia can't get like some sort of win to show for all their their war efforts, they might end up doing increasingly destructive and destabilizing things. Right. They might even use chemical weapons and keep on doing, um, yeah, destroying um, houses and civilians' um, properties. So do you, I've seen you recently like um, been active on Metaculus um, trying to predict the use of chemical weapons. Did you actually get to do a prediction on this? I predicted whether Russia would use chemical weapons. Um, I think it's pretty important to look at that question pretty carefully and understand kind of what is meant by a chemical weapon. Because I think when I think of using chemical weapons, I think of like what Syria did in terms of like battlefield use of like, say, chemical gas or other things on like army military targets or even civilian targets. But um, there's actually a lot of gradations to chemical weapons, um, and it could include um, just poisonings, even 
non-battlefield uses of poison. And um, non-battlefield uses of poison is actually something Russia likes to do a lot. Um, I think Russia is probably the most prolific poisoner um, of all the powers in the world today. Um, So I thought that there was a 40% chance that this question would resolve correctly with there being a, a clear case of where two permanent members of the UN Security Council um, assess that Russia has used a chemical weapon. But I thought that a vast majority of those scenarios would be non-battlefield uses of poison um, attributed to Russia rather than Russia doing a chemical weapon attack on the battlefield with, say, chlorine gas or something similar to what you may have seen from Syria, which, I mean, resolves the question all the same, but in my opinion is um, significantly more serious and worrying. Um, So I think the vast majority of my assessment comes from, yeah, non-battlefield poisonings technically being a chemical weapon. Interesting. And um, so you you said 40%, right? Yes. So how do you end up with um, this, this number? Is it mostly like from intuition or do you apply some methodology and with uh, using a base rate and then trying to extrapolate. Yeah, it definitely is um, very intuition driven. Um, I think you can know basic facts about Russia's use of chemical weapons. So recently they um, did an attempted assassination with poison um, in 2018 um, in the Skirpol case. And then again in 2020 with um, Navani. Um, which they didn't succeed, um, but used it nonetheless. And then they've been alleged to use or facilitate the use of chemical weapons in um, Chechnya in um, 1999 and 2002, and potentially again in assisting Syria in the 2017 civil war, though I think none of those three cases have been proven to um, the standards of this question. Um, And you might think that Russia would be, again, highly motivated to poison um, enemies, um, given that they've done this before, and now they face like strong incentives to do so again. Um, But I guess the main thing holding me back from thinking this is likely to happen is just the fact that it requires a pretty high standard of proof. You have to have two permanent members of the UN Security Council make such a, a definitive statement, which may be hard to come by, or have at least six prominent news sources such as The Economist, The New York Times, make a definitive statement. And I think there's going to be a lot of cases where um, there's a poisoning, but it's like hard to explicitly attribute it to Russia because they're usually pretty good at um, disguising their tracks to some case. Um, so kind of based on that, um, I thought that like I came to just 40% being like not more more unlikely to happen than to happen, but like still quite likely. It's also pretty close to the current community um, median prediction of 34%. Essentially, you're saying that um, taking into account previous um, use of chemical um, weapons to assassinate or uh, for for poisoning, um, you could say that it's higher than 50%, but because the question is quite strict about like the two members of the UN UN Security Council, you tend to um, to put it lower than 50% because um, it's very it's a very hard criteria to meet. Yeah, that's right. Um, and also, I guess if you're using a strict base rate, like I guess two times out of the past five years might suggest also like a 40% rate, though um, that wasn't like the main reason I chose 40%. So maybe we can move from, from this one to another um, prediction that is um, a bit more complex with different um, different parts that we can decompose. And um, so one thing we talked about was um, the probability of um, having a nuke in um, London um, killing um, so people living there. So there was a um, question on the Effective Altruism Forum about, um, yeah, what's the probability of this happening? I think they have a criteria where they multiply by the actual number of people that were killed. Um, So if maybe a half of the people in London were killed, it's um, then you get like half a chance of of dying if you're 
if you're there. Um, that's kind of a, a, a detail, but yeah, how would you approach of like decomposing a, a question like this into different like parts where you can condition on probabilities? Yeah, so you definitely the decomposition decomp that you mentioned is the key to answering such a complex question that basically you want to be able to break things down um, into different parts. So I guess first, in order for there to be a bomb in London, you need a, you can also just ask, like, what's the chance of a nuclear bomb being detonated anywhere? And then you can be like, okay, given that a bomb has been detonated somewhere, what's the chance of it being in London? So that's like kind of yeah, decomposition with a conditional forecast. And then I guess the chance of what's, if you go, what's the chance of there being a nuclear bomb detonated offensively? You might ask, like, what's the chance of there being war conditions that might lead to a nuclear exchange, such as like there being a formal war between NATO and Russia. And so then you can kind of really get into it. I think there's also like two main pathways to nuclear war. There's certainly intentional nuclear war, which is like NATO and Russia get into some sort of conflict. Um, Russia decides to launch a nuclear weapon and they decide to launch yeah, as a part of that conflict. And then they decide to launch that weapon at London in addition to or instead of other targets, um, with the UK obviously being part of NATO. Uh, then there's also accidental nuclear war, which would be Russia mistakenly thinks they're being nuked, um, and they decide to launch all their nukes in retaliation to try to get like a second strike before they're no longer able to strike, um, and one of those nukes hits London. Um, so you might want to go down both branches of that. Um, and then like, I guess you can just start assigning numbers. So like maybe there's like a 5% chance that there would be some sort of um, conflict between Russia and NATO. Um, the reason that being so low is like um, NATO is trying very hard not to be directly involved in the conflict. And Russia really has nothing to gain and everything to lose by taking a conflict directly with NATO because Russia is so much weaker than NATO militarily. Um, and then I guess if there's a war, like what's the chance nuclear weapons would be used? Um, that's like really hard to say. I would hope that, again, with mutually assured destruction, there'd be a lot of pressure and incentives on both sides to keep the conflict non-nuclear because they'd know that like a nuclear conflict would inevitably lead to the destruction of both countries. Um, no one really wins in a nuclear war. Um, so you probably would like try to see lots of attempts to end the war as fast as like peacefully if possible or try to find some sort of way to keep the conflict conventional for example russia is attacking ukraine right now but they're not like nuking ukraine um, it's like purely with conventional weaponry um, so like it's certainly possible that a war might stay conventional so maybe like there's like a just to throw a number out there like a 40 percent chance that it would be nuclear and then once you have a nuclear war, it's also not a guarantee that they would hit London. Um, they may only want to hit military targets and avoid civilian targets, mainly out of fear of retaliation. Um, and that's called like counter-force targeting, where you eliminate military targets versus counter-value targeting, where you try to go after huge cities. And so it's not a guarantee that a nuclear war would lead to hitting major population centers. In fact, I would expect that would be kind of preferred to be avoided. So maybe like 60% or something. And then you can multiply 0 0.6 times 0 0.4 times 0 0.5. I mean, 0 0.05. And then you would get like a 1% a chance or so of there being a nuclear war um, that targets London. Though I think actually on reflection, I would put it at under 1%, um, probably closer to like one third or one fifth of a percent. Um, and then you would also add in the accidental nuclear war side of things too, which I think luckily um, we haven't had any major um, accidents since 1995, but it used to be the case that like Russian sensors would detect weather events and like accidentally think they're nuclear launches or they detect peaceful rocket launches and accidentally mistake them as nuclear launches. And same in the United States and that like then you might try to trigger a nuclear war in response to this false alarm. But luckily in every case that's happened, we've successfully de-escalated and not launched a nuclear war. And so hopefully these accidents would continue to go down in frequency and also would continue to not result in a nuclear exchange. And so you could like quantify that, like how many accidents have there been? 
How likely is there to be another accident in the future? And then how likely is that accident to escalate into a nuclear war response? So I think in terms of um, yeah, accidents like um, the, the detection failure from um, yeah, mechanisms that try to detect uh, nuclear threats, I think there's been like two in the past 50 years. Um, at least that's what I saw um, in, in the data of Metacles. And um, so if, if we do like two in the past 50 years, it gives us like a base rate of uh, 4%. Um, but then um, I don't know about the probability of it um, de-escalating into uh, yeah, some kind of full-scale nuclear war. Yeah. I think my main disagreement um, from your take on it being kind of hard to for Russia to kind of um, target directly London and civilians instead of kind of military bases is that, um, yeah, for the past kind of couple of months, Putin has been very far from rational and he has targeted civilians. I think the question, yeah, is Putin a rational actor is definitely of debate. Um, I think like there's definitely some ways you could see him as still a rational actor and also many ways you could see him as not being a rational actor. So you might want to put some sort of probability over those two scenarios, like one where he's rational and one where he's not. And then like, assess the scenarios under each circumstance and then like integrate them together through multiplication. Um, and then of course, if he's irrational, there might be a question of like how irrational, um, like obviously I guess, um, killing civilians indiscriminately is incredibly terrible. Um, but nuking a major city would be like a whole nother level of terrible and also a whole nother level of provoking, um, the end of Russia through a nuclear retaliation. Um, I assume that Putin still doesn't want to end all of Russia. In fact, he seems pretty obsessed with his own survival and the survival of the Russian state. Um, I think that the main reason he'd use nuclear weapons is if he thought that the Russian state or his own survival was at um, huge risk, uh, which is, I think, why the United States is taking extreme pains to avoid making it look like they are trying to eliminate Russia or go to war with Russia directly. Um, yeah, but I do think that, like you said, I agree with you that you would have to take Putin's mental state into account when assessing the risk of him launching nukes and that you, um, might end up with a higher estimate if you take that into account, especially if you really think that he's an irrational actor. So the, the way for Casper do it is they, um, have a disjunctive scenario with like two or three different cases. So one you said is, uh, Putin is... Um, willing to kill civilians by nuking an entire city. And, and then you have like this hypothesis is like, is Putin willing to do um, such a terrible act or is Putin like below this level? Maybe it's a better dis distinction between then like irrational and rational because then it's very hard to say something uh, about some someone irrational. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is difficult to predict irrational behavior by definition. And in fact, there even kind of is like uh, if you're a geopolitical actor, even if you are perfectly rational, you may want to pretend to be irrational. That's like kind of the so-called madman theory um, that I think even Richard Nixon tried to do at one point where you really make it look like that you'd be ready to nuke anyone at any point. And as a result, people really, really try not to anger you and you get more of what you want. So it could be rational to appear irrational um, or Putin could just be irrational. And so I guess that kind of gets more into, yeah, game theory type scenarios where you like try to figure out, yeah, how would you deal with a, a less than rational actor? There's a possibility of Putin being rational, but pretending to be rational in a rational sense and him being like completely rational. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm curious, um, like when you go on predicting things on Metaculus, um, do you often like decompose um, in a kind of disjunctive scenarios or do you more often just like um, kind of assume something and, and then just do conditional probabilities and multiply them all together? Um, no, I definitely would do the disjunctive um, scenario analysis I was describing where I would like assign like, here's what I think the probabilities look like if Putin is a rational actor and here's what the probabilities look like if Putin is an irrational actor and maybe there might be shades of irrationality 
And then I would like multiply all those scenarios by the likelihood of Putin being in these various states. And so then you could get like an overall forecast that like goes over your uncertainty around Putin's mental state. I think this kind of resonates with a lot of work um, you might have done um, at Rethink Priorities. So the the nonprofit, your co-CEO, um, where you try to kind of estimate the, the, the risk of nuclear war um, before uh, Ukraine. So do you, um, do you know what's the kind of risk of nuclear war when we're um, not in a cold war or not in a war with Ukraine? Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, Rethink Parties is the research organization I run, and we've tried to assess nuclear risk. Um, as an organization, we haven't actually done any recent work post-Russia conflict, so we haven't had a chance to update our numbers officially. But I would say, like, unofficially, I guess, I think the Metaculus assessment looks pretty good um, and well-reasoned to me. Um, I might be maybe personally inclined to think that things aren't quite as scary as during the Cold War, especially, I guess, it depends on when in the Cold War. Um, I guess we... We definitely enjoyed a relative peace between 2000 and 2020 with after the fall of the Soviet Union, but before the current conflicts, I guess, starting in 2014 or so and really hitting a turning point now. So definitely things are riskier now than they used to be. But I think during the Cold War, we had more, I guess, direct proxy conflict between the United States and Russia um, than we did now, like multiple different conflicts rather than just... Ukraine and higher stakes conflicts, like the Cuban Missile Crisis, certainly what feels much higher stakes than it than the Ukraine conflict when it comes to nuclear risk. And I suppose, I guess, another thing is just from a forecasting standpoint, like if we rewind the clock to the 1970s and 1980s, we just have much less data on nuclear weapons at that point. And I think things would have looked subjectively much scarier because we would have already just survived much fewer years without conflict. And we would have had many more nuclear accident scenarios without having the foreknowledge that they would turn out okay. And so I think where we are now, we've had many more years experience understanding that nuclear weapons have not yet come to um, destroy the world. And also that we have much stronger norms against using nuclear weapons and better technology for nuclear weapon management. Um, I would be more confident now than I would be in, say, 1980s or especially 1960s. Though, of course, I'm definitely more scared today than I was five years ago. So are you saying that the fact that we've survived all those decades and that we have had peace for um, at least like, a, yeah, the nuclear, um, so that the Cold War ended like 20 years ago, uh, 30 years ago. So that did this is like an element for you being... Uh, more calm towards uh, nuclear risk because uh, we're more prepared. We had, there's like more analysis in this. There's more conventions. Um, is this essentially what, what you're saying? Yeah. So I'm saying if I was sitting in this chair in 1980, um, I guess we wouldn't have podcasts then, but maybe you and I would be chatting over the phone or via letters or something. And I would have seen that we would have had seven accidental nuclear incidents in just the past 30 years. I would see the Soviets invading Afghanistan and I would see Reagan, quote, vowing to, quote, confront the Soviets everywhere. And I would see Soviet nuclear stockpiles at an all time high with total stockpiles of nukes six times larger than they are today. Um, I would be a lot more afraid of accidental or intentional nuclear war in the 1980s than I, I am now having seen us successfully navigate the 80s having seen a ton of nuclear disarmament, having seen stronger norms against nuclear weapons as a geopolitical tool. Um, of course, that doesn't mean there's no risk. I mean, we've been trying to assess the risk on this podcast and in other articles. And I definitely um, miss the relative piece of the 2010s, for example, um, or at least the early 2010s before Crimea. Um yeah, and so I think things still just don't look nearly as bad as 1980 or 1960. Gotcha. So disarmament? Yeah, disarmament seems like a big factor. Stronger norms. And um, then the kind of the base rate when you're in the uh, 1980s is maybe 40 years. And, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, and now we have like um, yeah, 80 years. 
Yeah, certainly observing 40 additional years of no nuclear destruction should add a lot more data to any model that would make you feel more confident um, in avoiding avoiding disaster. One of the things that um, the charity you're running, um, Breathing Priorities, is doing is helping with yeah, creating tournaments for assessing nuclear risk. I think you were kind of helping with this nuclear risk forecasting tournament. Yeah. Yeah, we had the unfortunate foresight to run a nuclear risk tournament prior to the, the current Ukraine situation. What kind of insights did you get uh, from this tournament? Yeah, I think we're um, still kind of assessing some of the data that's come in. Um, and also many questions are still yet to resolve. So it might be a little too early to say. And then, of course, all the assessments need to be updated um, for our current geopolitical situation, which hopefully forecasters are doing. Um, but I think it was like really helpful for us to be able to just break down um, the, our analysis into a bunch of forecastable questions and then get like public to input on these uh, all variety of these questions and then like we can then piece the questions back together to create like more overall assessments so if i if i want to predict things now is there still like are there still like questions i can I can predict and win points on yeah there um there should be um uh yeah you should be able to go to the nuclear risk tournament on metaculus and um, view view the open questions and predict on those questions. Yeah, awesome. I'll do that. Um, yeah, I'm kind of curious because you said that um, you didn't have a chance to update um, much your probabilities um, since Luisa Rodriguez's report um, um, a couple of years back. So, do you um, is there like any team working on um, yeah doing research on nuclear risk and um, calibrating those estimates and did, like is there like any follow-up report or research ongoing research that's going on yeah so after so luisa rodriguez was a researcher at rethink priorities and she led our nuclear risk research and published several articles to the effect on the effective altruism forum um, since then we hired michael aird as a researcher um, he's now a senior research manager at rethink priorities and um, he spent another year or so doing more research into nuclear weapons, including building that Metaculus tournament. Um, and, but ultimately, as a strategy decision, we decided to um, pivot our team away from researching nuclear risk and instead towards researching AI governance and strategy. And so Michael Aird now leads a AI um, governance and strategy team, and we're not currently doing any nuclear weapons. And unfortunately, due to that pivot, we um, did not finish polishing and publishing a lot of our work. But given that there seems to be a lot of interest and demand in this work, Michael aired on his personal time has been publishing some of his drafts in a more um, notes format that doesn't kind of meet our normal quality standards. But we decided it was better to publish something than not publish anything at all. So you can start to see that on the EA forum um, right now, actually, um, some of Michael's output um, on nuclear risk. But now where our team is focused on um, AI governance and um, strategy. Yeah, that's a bit unfortunate for um, yeah, nuclear risk. But um, as this is a, an AI podcast, <laughs> we kind of approve of, of this. <laughs> yeah, it does help me get on your podcast. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm curious, what kind of work is the long-termist team um, that you're run and that you're managing uh, doing at the moment? Um, so you, you mentioned uh, AI governance. Is there like any other um, yeah work that is being done? So we have an AI governance team run by Michael Aird and also Amanda L. DeCockney, um, and then we have a second team in our long-termism department run by Lynch Zhang. And that second team is focused right now on um, trying to figure out how to make the best use of this um, very surprisingly massive amount of money available for people interested in long-termism 
from like Open Philanthropy, the FTX Future Fund, and other possible funders. Um, so we want to try to research different project ideas that might make use of large amounts of money and then like directly try to get them started based on our research. Um, so we're kind of taking a research and incubation approach. Um, so those are our two teams. You, you cannot say um, a surprisingly large amount of money without saying the, the large amount of money. Uh, otherwise, you're just bluffing. The FTX Future Fund already announced publicly that they're planning to spend somewhere between $100 million a year to $1 billion a year in U.S. dollars. And then Open Philanthropy, I think, also would have the capacity to also donate several hundred million dollars a year. Um, and then there certainly would be other donors too. Um, like I personally have no idea what Elon Musk is up to, um, but he already contributed billions of dollars um, to be donated um, in the future, near future, though I'm not exactly sure what his philanthropic priorities are. Um, and there's like definitely some other large players out there as well. Um, so like the total amount of money available is certainly a billion a year or greater. If Elon Musk has two billions to just um, have a, a new edit button on Twitter, <laughs> he might have some money for the long-term future. I would just suspect and hope so. Um, yeah, but there's certainly a lot of money that we don't necessarily know how to spend right away. So um, hopefully our team will learn how to um, spend it with one team focused on trying to just find highly scalable opportunities and another team trying to figure out how to spend the money specifically on AI governance and strategy issues to uh, move the needle on this very important priority. Right. So I think I'm kind of misinterpreted your um, kind of the goal of the team as um, your your org had like a massive amount of money and, and you, you, you were trying to like uh, spend it correctly. But no, you're trying to like, it's like a um, the work is to estimate how should OpenField or FTX spend their money. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, we're not lucky enough to have the money sitting in our own organization bank account. That certainly would be a very different scenario. But we are lucky enough to um, have um, good contacts with Open Philanthropy and FTX, where I think they would be willing to listen to our ideas and at least seriously consider them. And so I guess we consider ourselves more um, philanthropy advisors than actual grant makers. And yeah, have you kind of come across the um, patient philanthropy research by Philip Trammell? He was on the podcast a couple of episodes ago. Oh, cool. Yeah, I've definitely heard of some of his work, though I can't actually say that I fully understand it. I know he's done some work on, yeah, if you have like billions of dollars, um, what's the optimal um, spending in like a century? Um, though... If I remember correctly, you wrote about how you read um, Alden Karnofsky's um, sequence on um, the most important century and um, how the like all the possible future for humanity are kind of wild. I think it's like all possible views about humanity's futures are wild. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of curious if you kind of updated on that on like the this necessity of, of like spending your money in this century and not like later. Yeah, um, I did find, I did read his sequence on the most important century and did actually find it to be um, very personally persuasive to me. And um, so I guess I don't exactly know what Phil would say if he and I were talking and I think there's a very strong chance I just misunderstand what his views are. Um, but I guess like if patient philanthropy involves merely saving the money in a bank account and waiting till later, it doesn't seem like a good strategy to me for two reasons. Um, one is that, like Holden said, I think there's like a very hard to dismiss chance um, that we would see very transformative change in this century, especially from artificial intelligence, but potentially also including nuclear weapons or other ways as well. And that like we should take decisive action to try to mitigate those risks now while we still have a chance. And then secondly, I would think, even if it turns out that this is not the most important century um, and actually money would be better spent later, I still think we need to be spending now to build capacity um, so that once a crunch time does arise, we would have all the researchers already employed and ready 
um, to deploy the capital, we would have experience making grants and have all the infrastructure needed to identify promising opportunities and move large amounts of money to those opportunities. So hopefully we still would be spending multiple hundreds of millions of dollars a year just preparing for the most important century whenever that takes place. I think between those two considerations, I'm pretty inclined to try to spend as much money now as um, we can, I guess, like subject to some cost effectiveness bar. I just want to start by adding a disclaimer that um, I haven't read uh, everything you wrote about vision philanthropy and, and I don't know fully the, the details of the model. Um, so it's kind of an, an amateur. <laughs> Same. <laughs> but um, f- from from what I um, I kind of understood, it's not, so the distinction is not really uh, between um, this century or the next one is more like um, 20 years, 50 years, 70 years. Um, and like, what's the perfect portfolio and like on, on your spending? Um, so yeah, um, yeah, I think I, I, I was the one to put you in the direction of like <laughs> <laughs> this century or the, or the next one. I'm so, uh, I'm the culprit here. Um, um, and, and then um, I think there's like um, kind of a distinction between uh, putting your money in your bank account and investing. And I think there's something um, about, yeah, like investing in, um, you know, things that get like 10%, um, 8% uh, interest a year, where that could like double um, in, in like a dec- uh, decade. And, and then you could get like large amount of, of, of interest. And also, I think another comment I've seen is that um, you, you should treat like investing as like um, a very large definition um, and not just like investing uh, for financial investing because uh, what you mentioned bet- um, about like creating meta structures. So essentially it's a difference between like investing in like your money into something and doing direct work. So it's like between spending, let's say 1 million in like AI safety research today or um, investing in like building better labs or something and like having a better community. And so I think your kind of definition of like building meta structures would kind of be considered as investing. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because I think one really high return thing might be just like trying to grow yeah, the community of people interested in these issues. So, um, and that like probably would exceed standard market returns. And yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if Phil was listening to this podcast, he might be like, you idiot, you have no, I clearly have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, I think that's like incredibly likely because I haven't really spent that much time thinking about his work. Um, my main goal though is just to try to come up with great opportunities to deploy as much money as fast as possible, subject to some cost effectiveness bar, like maybe being like eight times better than give directly or something. Definitely. And I think like if you have like um, medium to short um, timelines in AI, you could even think that, you know, um, spending money to have like more people doing PhD and, and getting their like peak productivity of researcher, maybe like mm-hmm. five years or, or 10 years after the PhD is like maybe like a waste of, of money. Um, and, and that maybe you could just like throw a bunch of money to like ex- um, researchers that are already like at their peak now and do, like direct work now instead of like uh, planning for like 15 years, 20 years, um, depending on like or sh- how short are your timelines. But I think um, the, the optimal amount of spending kind of resonates with another one of the posts um, I've seen of yours, which is about the like scalability of EA orgs. So um, I think you wrote something on the FSC Vulture Forum on um, why nonprofits should be scalable. Could you like kind of summarize the post for people who haven't read it? Yeah, so I think the basic summary of the idea is that if there is a less cost-effective opportunity, but it's more scalable, um, like it can take on more money, it actually frequently can be better to fund that than to fund a more cost-effective but less scalable opportunity. Um, the reason being that there's like a ton of money available to fund stuff, and there's like analysis costs and like figuring out what to fund and how to fund it. And like, if you can spend the same amount of analysis to come up with these like really scalable opportunities, assuming they meet some cost effectiveness bar, like it'll just use up the entire EA portfolio f- much faster. And this like assumes that using up the portfolio faster is preferable to like saving it in a bank account or, or something like that. Um, so that kind of motivates a lot of my current focus on highly scalable projects as well as growing rethink priorities. Um, as quickly as is feasible. 
how do you kind of uh, compare the different burn rates between like funding like two or three projects and, and funding like one mega project? What, what, why would like funding three different projects burn more money? What do you mean by it would burn? like why would there be more analysis costs? Oh, so the, the analysis cost is from the granting, right? Yeah, it would come from both the EI research time needed to identify the opportunity and to vet the opportunity, and then it would come from the the cost of actually yeah, transferring the funds, which I assume are much, much cheaper than the costs of researching and identifying the opportunity. Right. So the okay. So so the the main point is that having like one like one project um, would cost like less time in researching it at the beginning and and to like evaluate. Yeah. Then I think another important aspect is um, things other than money that projects might take up, such as like highly talented people that are in short supply or something. So like a highly scalable project might also be something where you can do a lot of good, even without a lot of like highly talented, effective altruists or um, other like scarce resources in addition to capital. Um, so it's kind of about, yeah, like making the portfolio do more without having all of our resources just kind of sitting and waiting. Do you think we're like bottlenecked on Yeah, I think we are currently only donating a very small percent of the overall EA portfolio, and I think the like monetarily, and I think the money in the EA portfolio is actually growing faster than we can currently spend it. Um, so it definitely doesn't seem like money is the core bottleneck, right? At least for now. Um, what instead would be a bottleneck would be, yeah, like available researchers with sufficient talent and sufficient mission alignment to like identify great opportunities to fund. And also, um, yeah, like sufficiently talented people to run those great opportunities. Um, so I think like, yeah, personnel is a definitely scarcer. What about the like cost of having like one big organization where like everything is kind of slow and between like having like one organization that did like, I don't know, 100, 100 people and like five startups that are like 20 people? Yeah, I mean, I'm certainly not advocating having only one organization. So you probably would want a mix of both, like maybe some scalable efforts on AI combined with some small AI research outfits. And it's certainly possible that a less scalable opportunity might still be overall more cost effective just because it's like so much better per dollar. Um, but I think there's like important returns from scalable organizations too, such as like, yeah, they use up more capital. So you're putting more capital to work instead of saving it and then also there can frequently be economies of scale um, like large companies can just have resources to do more things um, you can collaborate um, with yeah more people do more things have bigger things run things more efficiently through like consolidation um, like there's certainly returns to scale as well though yeah i do worry about yeah bureaucracy and um, other ways that big organizations might be slow and not um, not work as well. So I think, yeah, you need to intentionally design that with that in mind as well as, um, yeah, have some more nimble opportunities as well. Is, is that something you try to apply at Rethink Priorities? Like... Yeah, so I'm definitely trying to intentionally grow Rethink Priorities to be um, quite large because I think that there's a lot of important research questions to answer and a lot of people that could be good researchers if given the proper training and opportunities. And so I'd like to grow Rethink Priorities to take on more early career researchers and mentor them and scale them up to do important questions. And um, I think like, I'm definitely really excited to grow Rethink Priorities in that way. Um, but yeah, I do definitely wanna be really mindful of ways in which our culture might break down um, or things might get a lot worse by being larger. Um, and I think I've seen other organizations fail in that way so that's something we're definitely being very mindful of do you want to talk a little bit about like yeah, the different roles you're hiring for now and yeah what kind of like people you're kind of expecting to apply for those roles yeah so if you're listening to this podcast before april 17th of 2022 um, we should have plenty of roles open and i'm going to talk about those it's also possible if you're listening to this much later we might be hiring more still so definitely feel free to check out our website at rethinkparties.org and hover over about us and click on career opportunities. You can learn about all our openings or follow us on social media. 
Um, but yeah, the current openings as of the recording of this podcast, um, I'm definitely very excited to offer opportunities on a lot of our teams. So our AI governance and strategy team that I was talking about, we're looking for research fellows, which are kind of a position where you um, try out being a researcher for three to five months and you decide if it's something that you like and we decide if it's something we think you're really good at. And, um, and I think in a lot of cases, uh, we really would try for every fellow to get them a permanent research position at Rethink Priorities or at another organization, assuming that's something they want. Um, so I'm excited for the fellowship to like just kind of open up doors to a lot of people that want to try research. And then also we're hiring for research assistants. Um, these are permanent positions, um, but they're kind of more in a role where you're assisting another researcher as opposed to doing a lot of research yourself. And this could be another great way to learn how to do research and eventually um, become a researcher yourself if that's something you want, um, where you kind of get like an opportunity to be in the environment and see a lot of the work. And then in addition to assistants and fellows on the AI governance and strategy team, we're doing the same for that team that was focused on building large projects. Um, so you could help our team like with deciding what opportunities to um, try to go after and like decide how to approach them. Um, that's our general long-termism team, though I think it really needs a better name. Um, and so we're hiring in that area too. Um, and then to um, facilitate a lot of this, we're hiring on the operations side as well. So if there's any people listening to your podcast that don't want to do research but like building organizations, um, they could apply to our operations roles, including our new special projects department, which is going to be actually doing the nitty gritty work of like building some of these opportunities from the ground up. So I think that could be um, a really exciting opportunity as well. What kind of opportunities do you plan to build from the ground up? Yeah, so we're still at the idea stage right now. But um, one thing we wrote about on the EA forum that we'd be interested in more feedback on would be like a, a much bigger forecasting center to provide more early warning opportunities. Um, some of the forecasting I was talking about earlier just kind of expanding that and like really trying to figure out um, like what are the current risks and um, how likely are they and um, what, and also be able to early alert when they become more likely so that we could take quicker action. I think this might be especially useful for like pandemics or other things that might escalate rapidly. Um, and so that's something we've written about. And then we have some ideas that we're um, in the process of writing up to get more, more feedback and then ultimately we'll pick like say two or three ideas and um, launch them um, and try out just yeah, seeing if we can build some scalable opportunities to use long-termist money. Um, I was also going to plug one last role too, which is if you like me personally and you want to help me out, I'm looking to get a research assistant for myself um, to help me with like various tasks and projects. And like, that could be a great opportunity to see rethink parties from a high level and get like, personal mentorship and support from me. Um, and like, I think that could also be a great stepping stone role for someone looking to get involved in research. So if you, if you like Peter uh, Wilford <laughs> from this podcast, just apply to be his personal research assistant. Um, yeah, I'm excited. And I'm, I'm kind of curious about the kind of AI governance research role um, because yeah. I, I don't think you've kind of mentioned what would um, someone in this role like kind of research in a day-to-day -day basis uh, would it be like kind of um, write a report on what's the optimal uh, AI governance? Um, um, yeah, what would lo would look like in the next six months uh, or like a year? Um, what's kind of the um, yeah output you're expecting from this? Uh, what's kind of the analysis you're you're trying to get? Yeah, so I mean, we we work for stakeholders that um, are looking to us for specific research projects to inform their grant making. So I think like a lot of the projects aren't, are some of them are high level projects such as figuring out different intermediate goals that we may have um, and like just trying to map the landscape of possible interventions that could be funded. Um, so for example, an intermediate goal might be to like um, improve immigration to the United States with the hope that like skilled immigration with the hope that like that helps bolster AI talent in the United States. Um, but we also are interested in more specific um, projects as well, such as like 
we're looking at to how like a whistleblowing system might work for AI um, um, or other things like maybe looking at ways AI might deceive uh, people when when it's deployed and how we might mitigate that um, or other research topics um, such as those. So like there's like a definitely a mix of high level and highly concrete um, topics. I don't fully get the whistleblowing part. So do, do we need like an, an Edward Snowden for um, <laughs> AI safety? What, what's going on? So it would be kind of like an Edward Snowden for AI risk, but one where um, he gets rewarded and um, the U.S. government would be like excited about it as opposed to one where he has to like flee the country. Is it like artificial general intelligence or more like a misuse of AI in the narrow sense where one could like uh, create deepfakes or um, launch like uh, military drones? Yeah, all our research that we do is focused on yeah, the long-term impacts of yeah, more transformative AI systems, including artificial general intelligence. Um, and yeah, our research, we are, we're not concerned with deep fakes or other near-term outcomes, except insofar as they help us understand and mitigate more existential level outcomes or transformative outcomes. That's awesome. Um, I think that's a, a great sentence to, um, to, to end uh, the podcast on. So you've heard Peter Wilberford, uh, on the podcast. If you want to be his personal assistant and learn a lot, you can apply for that or different positions on AI governance. Yeah, definitely really excited. Thanks, Peter, for uh, being here. And I hope I talk to you again soon. Yeah, me too. Thanks for having me on the show.